And there was a woman who had had a spirit of infirmity for 18 years. She was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. And when Jesus saw her, he called her and said to her, Woman, you are free from your infirmity. And he laid his hands upon her, and immediately she was made straight. And she praised God. But the ruler of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, said to the people, There are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. Then the Lord answered him, You hypocrite, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his ass from the manger and lead it away to water it? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for eighteen years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? As Jesus said this, all his adversaries were put to shame, and all the people rejoiced, and all the glorious things that were done by him. So let's discuss um, hypocrisy a little bit, since it's the central theme of this gospel. Hypocrisy. The Lord even says it so sharply, doesn't it? You, hypocrite. <laughs> How would you respond to that? I mean, you, hypocrite. Well, let's look at what, why. I mean, this is a deep problem, and it's a deep problem then, and it's a deep problem now. The question of, of hypocrisy. Hypocrisy, so I, I had to look up some words in the dictionary this morning, you know, just to get the right, exact, modern understanding of hypocrisy. Hypocrisy basically says, you know, uh, basically says, do what I say, not what I do. <laughs> I'm living a certain way, and it's not necessarily what I'm teaching. So keep in mind, these teachers, these rulers, you know, these official people, they were official in that religion, in that place. And the people respected them. They, they honored, it was their way of life. You know, the Jewish way of life, the old uh, Israeli way, Israelite way of life was very close, very, you know, tight. It was bound up in the law, but it was very tight. So whatever they said, you know, whatever the teacher said, it was bound to be listened to. There was obedience, like you heard in that epistle. Obedience, obedience. So what happens when the teacher or the leader speaks a word, but then they do whatever they want against that word or against the law and against, you know, what the people are hearing? A lot of negativity comes out of that. You know, there's, there's several big kind of categories we can put them in. Let's do two. One is, um, <clears throat> well, it plants this hypocrisy because, you know, people who are in a faith are not dumb. You know, they're not, they're not unaware of their responsibility, and surely they're not unaware of the teacher's responsibility or of the leader's responsibility. That one has a, a special covenant to honor what they're saying, or just don't say it. Our bishop, you know, back in um, when I was in seminary, he said, okay, now don't teach anything that you're not living. Oh my gosh, can you imagine? That is enough to discourage you from getting ordained right there. Don't, if you're not doing it, if you're not trying to struggle against it and fight it, and it, don't teach about it. So then when your people ask you, how come you never teach about such and such, you can hang your head and say... <laughs> Because I'm the big sinner and the big hypocrite. If I say it, I'm the big hypocrite. So, what is the Lord attacking here in this hypocrisy? He's attacking confusion, first of all. First of all, confusion. Because people do scratch their heads and say, Huh? You're... This is the teaching. So let's say today, this is the teaching of the church. And yet, God forbid, we have 
bishops and priests who are teaching not the teaching of the church. That's at best confusing, at best. At worst, division, divisive, you know. And in that time, these, these wags, these, uh, what were they, the Sanhedrin, the, even the Sadducees and the Pharisees, you know, they were all divided among themselves too. But they were trying again then to divide more and more. The people against Christ. The people against each other. The people against, you know, God knows. So that they could have a little bit of power. If you go to the underlying reason why there's hypocrisy, it's because people want power and they don't want to be told what to do when they're at the top. God forbid that happens in the church. It happens enough in the state, you know. It happens enough. Like, look, um, kings and emperors and queens and presidents and governors and, you know, they say something, they give you a law, and then they do something else. And then they hope you don't catch them. So, hypocrisy, capital H, underlined, okay? And it's happening everywhere. So, it happened at that time in the, church, in the, in the Jewish community. And Christ called it out. He said, you hypocrites. For instance, then he gives the example, are you going to do work on the Sabbath if, unless your donkey's going to die, unless you free it on the Sabbath? And this woman, because here's the reason, his love, his love, you know, that de deep love for people, for sick people, for hurt people, for struggling people, for depressed people, for people longing for just a moment's peace in this life. 18 years, you know, bent, like way... Gosh, if you ever had like a backache, you know what that's like this much, a little bit. She was like that two decades. He had pity on her. He loved her. She is his daughter. And he healed her. And so what? He healed her on the Sabbath. So what? He healed her, you know, at a time when it's unusual to do any work. But which is higher? The, lo the love or the law? He says in another place, same kind of thing. This happens over and over in his life. He's always confronted with this hypocrisy. And he always answers the same way. The Sabbath is a thing. You know, it's a thing that was established because you are incomplete. You need law. You need like um, big rules, like a big boundary of rules all the time. Do this. Don't do this. Do this. And then you can not only pretend that you're following that, but then you could look at everybody else and see if they're following or not. See, that's the problem with the rules. We're looking at the rules, and then we're looking at each other. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Oh. What about this? What about that? And that leads to the second. The second, besides being confused, it also causes some judgmentalism. First of all, on the part of the first attackers, the leaders themselves, who are saying, you are not following the rules. It's a big indictment. I, you know, it, if, if, if the bishop called me tomorrow and said, I'm going to give you 10 years off from, I say, okay. And one of the reasons why I would say glory to God was for this. Do you know how difficult it is to look at people and to try like to, what's the word, like nudge them? Like, it, it's, it requires a certain amount of judgment. And that comes back on the priest. That comes back on the one who's looking, right? If I was sitting there, you know, one of you, I'd just close my eyes and let people live their life. We're not supposed to judge. We're not supposed to even notice. So it's an unfavorable position to get ordained. I shouldn't say that because some of you I'm looking at for possible ordination. <laughs> But you have to live with this. And you should already be living with it as a layperson. So that goes without saying. But when you become a leader, a teacher, a something where other people are maybe responsible and you can negotiate because you have a loving relationship, you have to be able to say, what is this? What is this? What is this little bit of a mess right here? Right? And to say it so that it doesn't poison your own heart. You get that? That's the part where judgment comes in. Like when we say things against other people because they're not following the rules, whatever rules, earthly rules, churchly rules, divine rules, doesn't matter. If it's, if it's limited or um, 
lowered to the state of rules and regs, you're always going to have this problem of judgment. Unless you have a little bit of love. If you have love, there's no judgment. The saints do that. And here's kind of like a, a practical hand, hand, hand work. If someone needs to be corrected, get a blessing to correct them, first of all. And secondly, do it only because you have no sin in that area. How's that? Like if you're going to talk to somebody about, I don't know, their prayers. Or you're not praying right or something, I don't know. Your prayer life better be like spot on, 100%. You're with Christ. You're praying noetically. You're in theosis in your prayer. Before you say, hey, you know what? Your prayer is wrong. You're doing this wrong. You see? The saints actually did that. They accomplished a certain level of maturity through humility so that when they were forced, let's say, to say some corrective measure to someone, they gave it to them. You know how they gave it to them? How do you think? As a gift. They gave it as a gift. Like, it would be blessed. They don't even say, you should, you, you, you know. It would be blessed if you would try this. Just try this. And then when the person responded poorly, like, by the grace of God, they receive it well. But if they responded so poorly, then it doesn't hurt the one who's saintly already because they have no ego left. There's nothing. There's no pride. There's no... They just rejected what I said, but I'm only saying what Christ teaches as far as I understand. So, okay, then do what you want. Do, you, do as you please, right? I've told this story before. You know, tomorrow we, we commemorate the one year falling asleep of Yerinda Ephraim. Elder Ephraim, there's a story of uh, uh, Greek, a Greek, per, of course it's a Greek. We always have to pick on the Greeks, right? <laughs> no. The Greeks, they're like animated in their faith. We'll put it like that. So the Greek fellow who comes before the elder, and he says, Yeranda, I have some big decision to make. I, ha I can do this. And then, of course, you know, there's all the explanation of A, and then, or all the explanation of B. And, you know, the Yeranda, and elders are like this. You know, they, they're patient, they say. They sit there, and they, and he says, now what should I do? You tell me what decision I should make. Now listen. He's put that question in front of a holy elder who knows, especially during those times like divine windows get opened up at those times when you actually ask a question and you're ready to commit to that answer, right? So the elder, the same thing that I was just talking about, he doesn't say, you should do this. He says something about whatever A was, let's say, and he says, A would bring great blessings. That's all. You see how innocuous, like this would bring great blessings. Maybe, try that. And so the guy says, but I don't want to do that. I want to do this. And here's, then he gives all the reasons why he should do the exact opposite of what the elder told him. Now, if that was you, and you listened to all of that, and then you gave a recommendation, actually a real strong blessing, and you should do this. And then the other person decides to do the other thing, what would you do? Many of us get upset. We get hurt. We get, uh, well, how can you disagree? Like, see, now this, take an example of what the saints do. He said, you gave him a blessing. He said, okay, do that. Now go. <laughs> do that. What you Do what you want to do. Because isn't that what's left? Isn't that all that's left when we decide to, like, impose our own will like that? We're living with this constantly all around us constantly this type of self-will self-ego and all that but also resulting in some hypocrisy I pretend like this guy this we'll pick on this poor Greek you don't know him I don't know him either he pretends to have a spiritual father he pretends to go to the elder he pretends you know that I have an elder and I'm going to do it and then at the end of the day he has no spiritual father no no I'll correct it. He has a spiritual father himself. And you know what they say. He who chooses himself as a spiritual guide has chosen fool. A fool. Because we will always excuse behavior and da 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 da. Okay. So you get that? It's a very important idea. Not to confuse people. Not to cause judgmentalism. 
and all of its forms, right? And hypocrisy ultimately, and this is maybe the worst of the three. Oh, I said two. I'll do three. <laughs> the worst is it causes cynicism in the faithful or in people. It causes people to be cynical. And again, I had to look that one up this morning. I said, let me get it exactly right. And you know what's in that definition of cynicism? Several, several times, one is mistrust. It causes mistrust, distrust. Like you can't believe the motives of the teacher. You can't believe what they're saying. You think that they're saying that for some ulterior motive. God forbid. God forbid we hear it from leaders. God forbid we hear it from people, leaders in the church. If there's no authenticity there, then it's going to cause in our beloved people cynicism. And believe me, this is a curse, cynicism. When I was in seminary, I, was, I had the blessing of being a um, seminarian under uh, Archbishop Dimitri of blessed memory, a very saintly bishop. And he was the bishop in the south for the OCA. So when I was in seminary, he came to visit his seminarians. And at lunchtime, they invited him one, one after lunch, one day on the uh, campus, you know, with all the seminarians, to give a little talk. And, you know, his, his talk was very short, but it was like pungent. Boom. He said, seminarians, the number one thing you have to avoid, not only as seminarians, but as priests, cynicism. Cynicism. And there's a lot of things you're going to see that might move you in the direction of being cynical. Fight against that. Because that, of all things, will land you in hell. First of all, hell of your own making in this life. But really, like, hell, hell, to be cynical about people, about the church, about others, about, you know, like, you have to be discerning, you know, wise as a serpent, but gentle as a dove. But you can never be cynical. Cynicism is disastrous to the soul. It's got so much poison, so much toxicity. It drags the, it drags the person like way far away. And they just think, you know, nothing's good. Nothing in the church leadership. Nothing in the decisions. Nothing in the way we're living our life. And eventually they just kind of, even if they stay, even if they come every Sunday and sit right there, they're not there. <coughs> they're not there anymore. But uh, more, more likely, they just kind of fade off and just disappear. Why? Eh, I don't believe in it. And you hear that in 20, what year is it now? 2020. You hear it. Well, you know, I just don't, Father, I just don't have it. I just don't have the belief. And, and here's the deal. They are cynical for reason many times because they've been hurt. Now, we could talk about how you should never get hurt because you should have no ego to get hurt and all of that. We talk about that a lot. But they've been harmed somehow. And you ask them, will you ever come back to the church? No, some priest, you know, like 30 years ago hurt me. Or some bishop is teaching this craziness and I'm not coming back to this church anymore. Or this person looked at me the wrong way or something. And they've become cynical. They've not just, they've not just had that one series of sins or one event or whatever, they've not had it forgiven because they've never offered it to Christ to be forgiven. Instead, it became the new foundation for a new way of thinking, a new way of life. That cynicism starts growing then inside of them, like a big tumor. And now all their decisions, instead of being based on the gospel, on our way of life, which we're always talking about, the gospel way of life, all the beatitudes, all the virtues, right? Instead of that, they kind of push that aside. Why? Well, because the major thing now is, I've been hurt. So all the virtues go off, because I've been hurt. So now the fact that I've been hurt, that's how I'm going to live from now on. And church gets dismissed, Christ gets dismissed, who knows? What el who else gets dismissed? And they become a different person. We'll say, that's all we'll say about that, because I'm going back to the original point. Anything that can plant a seed of cynicism in another person needs to be abandoned. Not only from teachers and leaders, but from each other. 
let's not have conversations which may plant a small, even a small seed of cynicism in another person. I can't remember where I heard this story, but it was something like there were two parents and they were both Orthodox. I mean, it was an Orthodox situation. And they, were dry, they would drive back and forth to church. And it was something like they would, they would say all the things that the priest did wrong. <laughs> and believe me, we do a lot wrong, obviously. But like on the way home from church, they'd be in the front seat, mom and dad. And in the back seat is little John, you know, and he's listening. What do you think is going to happen to the heart of that young man? He became so cynical. So cynical. He grew up to be like, not even a hater of the church. Just like, eh, this is even worse. The indifferent like this. Eh, who cares? Who needs the church? And we see that way more often than we see, I despise the church. We see more like, eh, who cares? And you know where that happens? I don't want to get off on this tangent, but... It happens, and I've just had this conversation with somebody, when you have a husband or a man and a wife to become a husband and a wife, they're thinking about being uh, married, but they have two completely different faiths, two completely different ways of life, and I've seen that. Now I can speak now not from reading a book, but from the painful sword that goes through the pastor's heart when he marries people of different faiths. Do you know what happens to the children? Exactly what I'm talking about right here. You have to wait like 15 or 20 years down the road to see it. You have to just kind of, you know, okay, let's just look at the clock and see what's going to happen. And then it unfolds. The children, when they have the first ability to breathe some free air where their parents aren't telling them what to do, guess what happens? They say, you know what? I don't need any church because... Mom said that this church of hers, she was so strict about it. Da, da, da. Dad said this church was so strict about it. And yet, both of them weren't strict enough to marry somebody of the same faith. Kids get that hypocrisy. They get that. And then they say, so how, how important can it be? Do you know this age now, these, these young people? They're watching us. They're watching us. And they're rightly watching us. They're watching us for hypocrisy. They're watching us for, like, you say it's so important, but look at the chaos it's caused. And it hurts. There's a deep hurt in the lives of that whole family. It's just, it's a disaster, ultimately. If you don't have the unity of vision and the unity of faith, and not only have it and talk, teach it, like talk about it, but live it. We don't do anything outside of these boundaries. And when we do, we're sorry for them. We bow low and we say, forgive me. And oh my gosh, I'm supposed to be doing this and I do this. And then you're okay. Then you're like human like the rest of us. But if you're like pretending, oh, I never do this. I'm teaching this, da, da, da. But I'm living this way. Mm -mm. This kills. This kills our children. This kills our catechumens. This kills whoever is watching. So keep watching. Keep watching. It's a good thing. You know, my son Maximus, he was a pretty, he was a pretty uh, sharp guy when he was growing up. He would catch me, like, I had to watch like for years, like long. He said, hey dad, do you remember that sermon you preached? Like 1997, Great Lent, third, did I said, no, no, I can't say that I do. He goes, well, I do. And you said, boop, 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 boop. And now, look what you're doing. Boop, boop, boop. <laughs> so keep watching. Keep watching because, you know, it's a, it's a gift. It's a gift to root out hypocrisy. We have to do it in a loving way. Don't do it like that, pointing fingers at your parents. Please don't do that. But just kind of like kiss their feet, kiss their hands, and say, I'm just noticing something, and you'll get it in there the right way, okay? God help you. But, but look, this is, these children, the only way, the only way they're going to be blessed in the bosom of Christ, in the church, during the difficult times coming, and not just sell out and say, well, the church is nothing. I could, I could just do anything the government tells me. I can just do anything the culture tells me. I can do anything like evil, the evil one tells me. Why? Yeah. 
I saw the parents and the priests and all of them. They, they talked a good game, but eh, come on, look at who they are. Look what they do. God forbid. You know what kind of an indictment that is, right? It's the same indictment that Christ gives to those Pharisees. You hypocrites. You hypocrites. I never want to hear that word. If anything, if I can at least say, Master, I struggled, I sweated, I bled to not be a hypocrite. If I struggled with something, I, pr I promise I didn't try to teach it to somebody. And if I did, have mercy on me because I was trying to give them something that I wasn't able to do. Or so, You know, parents, teachers, husbands, wives, take that seriously, okay? This teaching is so essential. You'll find yourself being more quiet if you follow this. Not so willing to... You'll find yourself being more merciful, for sure. I'll close with this one story, this one image. And then we'll just try to leave hypocrisy like by the wayside. Okay? Together. So Abba Moses, you know, St. Moses, the black. He was... After he was the abbot, and they, he was on the council, you know, of elders in Egypt. And they wanted him to judge a brother. Judge a brother, like he did something wrong, one of the monks. And they wanted him to come to, the, to be on the council of the ones who give him the sentence. And he, he refused to go, but they compelled him to go. So on the way, he's carrying a jug, like a gallon jug with a big hole in it, full of water. Big hole like and it's flowing out behind him. And they're asking him, Abba, what are you doing with this jug? And he says, I am filled with sins and they're flowing out behind me. And now I'm going to judge a brother. And they drop the charges. I am going to judge a brother and look at my sins. Don't be hypocrites, you know? Because we all have these jugs. We all have them. So our job is to repair the hole. Just work on your own jug. <laughs> How's that? And don't even look at, at the big gushing jugs that are they're all around us. But if you notice them, that means you got a hole in your jug too. <laughs> On this.